Hi, Dave here from Melbourne SEO and Video, and I've got here Pat Flynn. Thanks Thank for having you so me, Dave. For taking the time. Uh, if you haven't seen Pat's blog, Smart Passive Income, uh, you have to check it out. It's, uh, Thank you. <laughs> it's just got some fantastic material, and I think uh, what really makes Pat stand out is just the transparency that he brings to his business. So I've got just a few key questions I thought might get a little bit of insight for you uh, as you're starting to build your business. So. Pat, maybe one thing that I want to try and find out for for you for me, you kind of just popped up on my radar recently, and it uh -huh. feels like it was almost what felt like over, overnight success. And now I'm seeing you everywhere. You're <laughs> getting mentioned everywhere. You're popping up. You're talking. You've got blogs. You've got um, you know networking. You, you've got different courses and things coming out. I just wanted to get an idea, though. I don't imagine this is an overnight success. Maybe Far just, from that. Yeah. Far from that. I mean, the way I got started online was actually not talking about how to do online business, it was actually in the architecture world. Mm. So I had actually um, been laid off from my architecture position, but I built a site to help myself and other people pass an exam in the architecture world before I was laid off. And then uh, that kind of took off on its own. I built a business around that mm. and it just changed my life. So getting laid off, giving me the opportunity to explore these other options was life changing. And as crappy as that moment was when you know I got that pink slip, uh, it was the best thing that ever happened because I was able to explore all these other options, try new things, and it also forced me to do things beyond my comfort zone because I felt like I needed to do it for my yeah. family, for the future. If I didn't get laid off, I'd still be doing architecture and I probably would have, I probably would be happy still, but not this happy and not, not have this much uh, freedom. But in, in that blog that I talked about that got yeah. everything started, I had put content into that site for a year and a half. Yeah. before even trying to monetize it. What, what year was that? 2007. Yeah, okay. Mid-2007. Yeah. I didn't monetize it until October 2008. Yeah. And uh, by then I had built up all this traffic and authority and expertise in this space. Even though I wasn't really an expert, like mm. I didn't know the questions and the exams front and back, but because I was the one online posting about it and communicating with these people who were in my shoes for, uh, it, it did really well. And then I started smartpassiveincome.com, which is where, where most people know me from. And then even that site, when I started it, it was just a passion. I just wanted to share everything that had happened, all the things I did right, all the things I wish I had done better. And that took about a year and a half until about things started to, to you know, people started to notice it. Um, but again, it, because it was something that was just a part of me and part of my life and I was excited about, you know, I wasn't going to stop. I just kept going. And uh, I think... You know, as a result of that, I mean, that's that's why I do business the way I do now because I've just put in all this time and effort into it, and I've seen and we'll talk about the transparency. That's yeah. that's by far the biggest thing that has helped me, you know, get my start. Well, I suppose leading into that transparency thing, the income reports is probably one of the, the <laughs> biggest sort of huge pieces of transparency. You put yourself out there, you kind of like opened the kimono and said, you know, here's how I run my business, and, yeah. and most people are very private with that sort of information. Um, you mentioned about moving to um, Smart Passive Income. When you did that, was that one of the first things that you added into that? Yeah, I mean, I did that because I thought it'd be cool because in the space that I'm in, you know, talking about online business, traditionally that's a very scammy, car salesman, all just based on hype, you know, people trying to just make money off of people's hopes and dreams and not really sharing the full everything. They would just mm -hmm. only show the best. And I wanted to show everything that had happened. Um, wins, failures, what went right, what went wrong. and. You know, I thought it'd be cool just for one month. I just was like, okay, I'm just gonna put my income for one month just to show everybody. It's like almost, you know, everybody in this industry talks the talk, but not everybody walks the walk, yeah. too. So I wanted to show people proof that this was for real. And uh, I did that, and you know, even though it was early in my blogging career, I got some incredible feedback from people like, wow, I've never seen this before. I can't believe you're doing this. And yeah, a lot of people are sort of secretive about the, the money they make, but I feel like if people are going to learn from me mm. in terms of building an online business, I need to be completely honest about how I am doing with my online businesses too. Yeah. You know, it's like in the US, the, the stock market, companies in the stock market, they show their quarterly earnings. Yeah. They share yeah. all of that. Why? So that their investors can understand whether or not that's something they should you know, continue yeah. investing in. And I feel like even though people aren't investing money with me, they're investing their time. And so I want to show that my stuff is worth their time. Yeah. And that's where that came from. And so I did it that one month, got such great positive feedback. I just decided to keep it going. I was like, I'll do it for three more months. And then it just kept building and building and building. And now I've done it for four years now. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it's the thing that people talk about the most. And you know, as far as your businesses out there, I mean, you don't need to share your income 
but what is it behind the scenes that you can share that will show that you're real, show that what you're talking about is actually for real. You know, it's like in the, um, in the 19th century, the, uh, in the American Revolution, these factories that were so secretive about their formulas and just how they did things because they didn't want anybody to, to learn their secrets. They, en they ended up opening up their factory doors and allowing people to come in to see the quality of the work they put in, the care that they put in the products. And when you do that, when you show people behind the scenes what's going on, they feel special. They feel like they know something that uh, most other people in the world don't. I mean, that's why we go to breweries, right? And we go to see how the beer is made, or we go to coffee shops and see everything and how, like all the fine little details. It gives you a little bit more appreciation for the product. Yeah. And so that's my way of doing it. What is your way of doing it? Yeah, and, and I think uh, it's one of those things that bond those your subscribers to you. And you've, you've got raving fans out there who just really love all the, the, the material you put out. You put anything out, and you'll get a lot of people actually want to have a look at it because they love what you do. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering, were there other things that you've done, um, like consciously or maybe looking back that you just did subconsciously, you just did it, um, that kind of helped bond those fans to you? Yeah, I mean, I talk a lot about what just goes on in my life normally, family stuff, things I'm interested in, hobbies, sports I like, Back to the Future, Lego, like those types of things which are just a part of me. And I wanted to be real online. I wanted to show who I am. And too many people try to show the best sides of them or just you know, what they think their audience wants to see. This is just me. And I think if you're trying to build a real relationship with your audience or your customers, you need to be real because when you're making friends with somebody, I mean, just think about friends that you have in real life outside of business. Like, you know fun, cool little things about them, right? That's what makes you friends. Yeah. And so I wanted to be everybody's friend online. And too many people I feel like, you know, back in the day I would subscribe to a list and all of a sudden I get bombarded with sale after sale after sale. They don't even know who I am, but they're trying to sell to me. Me, I want to get to know my audience first. And in order for me to get to know them, I need to have them get to know me. Yeah. And that's, you know, one of the biggest things, you know, in, in my podcast, uh, at the beginning of every show, I share a little fun fact about yeah. who I am. And it was really funny because I, when I told my mentors I was going to do that, they were like, that's so dumb. Like, why would you do that? You're wasting your time. And I actually have my voiceover guy read those for me. And that's one of the most talked about things. Whenever I go to conferences now, people pull up that information. They're like, dude, Pat, like, I'm also half Filipino. Or wow, I play fantasy football too. Like, they pull those random facts that they can connect with. And that's our starting point of our conversation. And even before I meet them, we're friends mm. because of sharing those little personal things. And that's something I just did kind of because that's who I am. Yeah. You know, I like to meet people and I, and, and I know that a part of meeting people is just, you know, sharing cool, fun little things about you, yeah. you know? It's funny, when I think about some of the really great films that you watch, like one that stuck out for me was like American Beauty and it tells the story of like three or four different characters, or maybe more, I think there's about four or five characters in there and they each have their own little story mm -hmm. and you end up associating with one of them. You yeah. kind of find oh, yeah things that are similar and it's the same thing you've probably got all of your audience who kind of hear you make you know a little comment about something that you like or something that you're interested in they go me too yeah yeah best, best friends I, yeah. I was in the marching band in high school and college and I have yeah. a huge following of people who did marching band <laughs> yeah. and you know I have a huge following of people who love back to the future to the point now where they see a fun little fact on BuzzFeed or something or somebody talks about it and then they're like Pat did you know this like they tag me on Twitter yeah. Pat back to the future news did you know about this and I'm like oh yeah of course or whatever um, it's just yeah I mean it might not seem like it matters, like sharing those things, but that what, that's what makes you a real person. Yeah. And people connect with people online, yeah. you know? It's like there's, there's this story of Pat that's getting told, and I think if you look back at your blog and you follow along, everything from looking at the financials, this was another thing we were talking about just before we started recording, um, having a look at your financials early and seeing the story told in there of, okay, Bluehost made up such a large, uh, is it Bluehost? Yeah. No, yeah, that there was a large uh, portion of the income, but then as time progresses and you start adding other layers of income in there and then you start bringing in your new products, I almost see like the financial statements as another way for the telling of that story yeah. as you mm -hmm. start bringing in staff members and how that affects cash flow and all those. Yeah, I'm taking people on a journey, yeah. you know, and that's what's really cool. Another fun thing that uh, I want to talk about really quick is with my architecture site. You know, it's just I'm selling practice exams and study guides and things like that. And it was going very well. First few months I was making ten, twenty thousand dollars a month with that, which was amazing and life changing. And then the you know, there was actually no competition at that time. And then the company who actually puts on this exam they came out with their own study guide. And I thought I was screwed. I thought I was done for. Why would people buy from me, Pat Flynn, when they can buy from the company that actually writes the questions? I thought I was done. 
my sales went up mm -hmm. at that point. And I didn't understand it. I'm like, why, why, why? I don't get it. Well, for one, I didn't have to charge as much because I didn't have an overhead. That was a huge organization that they needed to pay for. And secondly, and most importantly, and I asked my audience, why did you, like, I asked, why did you buy from me and not the United States Green Building Council? And they were like, well, I felt like I could relate to you more. You're, you're somebody who took the exam and I wanted to help you for providing the value that you did for me. I don't know who's on the other end in that company. I don't know where that money is going, but I want to provide you a reward for all the information and value you've provided for me. And yeah. I was like, wow, like yeah. this is the business model that every business should have. Provide information, provide value, and it'll come back in return. Yeah. And that's what I, what's what I teach. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's so many great lessons that you pick up just even in this chat with us now. And I think someone watching this will go, oh yeah, if, if I add that into my business, I can move my business along. Th there's probably a few insights that you would have had along the way. It's, it's always easier in hindsight to look back and go, well, now that I've built the business, <laughs> right, right. there might have been a few like key steps that you took or a few big things, whether it's getting customer support or adding team members on. I don't know if you could maybe make some, yeah, give us some ideas of, of things that helped you have breakthroughs. Well, there were a lot of things. Now, we were joking about how this question alone before I could just be an hour's worth of content. But there were a lot of things along the way. I mean, one, I just could not do it all by myself. Yeah. I needed to get help along the way. I'm not just talking about team members and virtual assistants. I'm talking about other people who share the same values who can push me and hold me accountable. Mm -hmm. Mastermind group is something that was incredibly important to me and vital to my success. I put myself and you know, got out of my comfort zone, talked to other people who were already successful online and just asked for help. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually a lot of them were willing to provide that help. Yeah. There's a lot of people out there just willing to answer a question or two. I mean, you don't want to be annoying or anything, but you know, I did what I could to provide value to them and they were happy to help me out along the way and they gave me some amazing advice. They were the ones who told me to publish a book for that architecture site. Mm. That was my very first mastermind group. I'm in three now. Mm. Three that meet weekly each week and we hold each other accountable. We share what's going on, the problems we're having. We all help each other out and we're honest, brutally honest with each other. Knowing that like when it's our turn, you know, everybody's going to be honest with us. And so that was huge. Um, getting that first sale. Yeah. was extremely important and I think every, every most entrepreneurs can remember that first customer and that just how how incredibly amazing that that feeling was and I remember my first one because it you know especially with the online stuff and creating products and courses and things like that like you could be working really hard on something for a really long time and not get paid for it right yeah. away because it, it, it takes that investment of time and energy up front to create something that can then make you money down the road and I remember working on that first ebook that I was gonna sell and Every day I was doubting myself, like why, why are people going to buy this? What, how am I going to sell this? I don't know what I'm doing, like I'm just, but I kept going, getting accountability from other people. Um, and then I remember putting it up for sale. It was, I actually put it up for sale at 3 a.m. when I had finished it. And then I went to bed, I woke up at like 8 a.m., no, no sales. I was like, you know, five hours later, but it was like the morning. So there, I like, and then at, at 8.30, a PayPal notification came in. I was like, I did it, yeah. I did it. So just work for that first, if you're just starting out, work for that first customer. If you come out with a new product, get that first customer on board. Yeah. And uh, that will help motivate you down the road. And it's really interesting, can, after I got that first sale, I walked outside, because I had to, I couldn't believe it, I was cooling off, and I got back to my computer, there was another sale that came in as I was outside walking. Yeah. And I was like, wow. I don't actually have to be here to provide value to my audience. Yeah. I need to put the time up front, create the systems to deliver that value 24 hours a day now. Um, I think that, that's a big one because I know there are going to be some people here, um, they might be delivering uh, product and service, physical stuff. A lot of my clients uh, are in that space. And I think adding in the digital component and selling digital product into a business, like that fits right in, in your sweet spot. I don't know if yeah. you could just maybe just talk a little bit to that, where, how sure, digital sure. product fits into business. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times our businesses require us to provide that value, you know, whether it's a service or something. It's hard to scale ourselves. Yeah. But you can still provide value. For example, if you're getting clients on board and they're paying you $1,000, you know, a month or something, and there might be people out there who could benefit from that information, but just don't, just can't afford it. But they would be willing to pay a little bit for a digital product that can help walk them through the way. There's a lot of things you could do out there digitally to serve your audience and get paid for it. Not just eBooks and courses, but even one, not one-to-one, -one, but one-to-many. 
you could do webinars and live courses like that and have people come on for a summit, for example. A lot of uh, US companies do summits where they have people sign up. It's almost like an online event. You know, an event like we're at now, except it's online. People sign up, they buy a ticket, and then they spend hours for one day just getting this content from all these guests who come on in a webinar style fashion. So the, the beauty with that is, is you have your worldwide audience. Yeah. And it's up to you and your marketing how many people you get coming in. Because when you're just one to one, you're limited to how many people you could serve. Yeah. So, you know, even though you might not be providing the same exact value as if you're doing it live, um, just think of how many more lives you could change if you package the information you have and, and sell it in a way that could provide value. Mm -hmm. um, I did have one other question. I know this is probably going a little bit longer than we initially Oh, no, please. Thought, I have all day. <laughs> um, once you kind of create this, this product stream and, and you're You've got multiple different product streams and you've also got multiple different traffic sources that come through to the site. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the ways that you're helping to get your message out there? Obviously the, the uh, podcast that you've got, that's, that's got to be one of the huge drivers. Um, is there any other traffic sources or is that kind of like the core focus for getting this message out there? Well originally I started with just a blog and the blog eventually was great at you know having people link to the site once I produce great content and you know people subscribing. but I reached a plateau with the blog in 2009, or 2010 actually. Um, no, actually late 2009, I reached a plateau. The same people commenting every time, the same people visiting the site, same traffic every day. Mm. So I was trying to figure out a way to sort of grow and expand. And actually my first step was actually going into YouTube. Yeah. And I was like, okay, we'll do- I'm we'll, a fan of YouTube. Yeah, yeah, no, I know you are. So I gave YouTube a shot and you know, I was a little scared of putting my face on camera, so I did a lot of screencasts. So yeah. I thought it was perfect because I could just talk and then show something on the computer and do a tutorial or some sort of lesson and it worked out really well. Yeah. And so I got more traffic. And then again in 2010, that plateaued a little bit. And so I was like, okay, well what can I do to expand my traffic? And then I discovered, well actually I had wanted to do a podcast for a while, but I finally was like, okay, I'm gonna do a podcast. And so I expanded onto iTunes and mm. did a podcast. And that helped grow the traffic as well. So each of those different channels, blogging, video, podcasting, I'm able to reach people in completely different ways and completely different mediums, but have them come and have my brand be a part of their lives. So they don't have any excuse yeah. not to have me, you know, whether they like to read, whether they, they like to watch, or whether they like to listen. There's no reason not, if the, if the content is valuable to them, there's no reason for them not to be able to have me. Because there's people who don't like to read, there's people yeah. who don't like to watch, there's people who don't like to listen. But now I'm serving them in all these different ways. But the cool thing about that sort of you know, content strategy on those multiple platforms is uh, not only are you reaching people who you wouldn't have reached if you didn't go onto those platforms, but in a, in a whole, your brand becomes this powerhouse. You're not just a blogger. Mm, You're not just why you. I see you everywhere. Right? Yeah. yeah. So it's like, and and it's it's just grown to be this brand yeah. now, which has been incredible. And in 2011, I did a survey to my blog readers only, asking, "How did you find out about me?" Because I was just curious to see which one maybe was more effective, and. So I asked, well, where, where did you first hear about me? And I had 7,500 respondents, which is a good sample size. Yeah. It blew me away, the, the response. Um, number one, iTunes, yeah. the podcast. One out of every five people, 20% of people found me and are now reading my mm. blog through the podcast. How, how frequently are you publishing? Once, once a week. Yeah, okay. So pretty, pretty Actually, at that time, it was only twice a week. Yeah. Or not, uh, once every other week, excuse me, yeah, yeah. bi-weekly. Second place was YouTube, 19%. And, and you only did a bit and then stopped? Yeah. So, yeah. YouTube's the sleeper, I reckon. <laughs> no, I mean, it, I, I've been, don't hate me, yeah. I, I haven't been doing what I should be doing on YouTube. Um, yeah. But that's going to change. perfect for video, it, Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Uh, but that's going to change next year. And third place was 15%, links from other sites. And I looked at the top three, podcasts and YouTube, and links from other sites. Well, all my time was spent on the blog, and on SEO, and on social media. I shifted my mindset where I should be spending my time, and that's why I went weekly with the podcast. Yes. Um, and now I'm gonna do more video. <laughs> yes. um, but you know, those platforms, which were a little uncomfortable for me, like I had yeah. to get over that fear. But once I got over that fear and did it, like. The results have been amazing, yeah. um, and I've learned that, you know, in terms of that fear. Every time I'm met with that fear, I feel like, 
if you can bust through it, there's something awesome on the other side. Now I'm doing it with public speaking. I would never yeah. have thought I would be on stage doing keynotes in front of hundreds keynote. of people. Yeah, there's like 600 people in the oh, room and you I, smashed it. I, if, I, if I knew I was going to do this like four years ago, I would have thrown up like every day until that day I spoke. <laughs> But now I'm doing it and it's just amazing because I did it and I just put myself in the deep end a little bit. I read and did some research to see how I could best provide yeah. value on stage, but now I'm addicted to it, I yeah. love it. Um, so now my next platform beyond those initial three are is the, is the, the stage. Yeah, yeah. And I imagine it's like, it's like a muscle. Like each one of these things, you're just growing it a little bit each day, stretching yeah. a little bit further. And, and you have to do it one at a time though. Yeah. At least with you know bodybuilding, you can work multiple muscles at the same time. But if you're building a brand and you're trying to expand onto these different platforms, don't make the mistake of trying to be on all of them at the same time. Yeah, gotcha. Because then you're not giving any one of them a chance to really, truly be successful. Yeah. Focus on one, master it, be comfortable with it, get your systems in place, optimize it, yeah. then move on. Yeah. And that's where I did really well because I, I did the blog first, did really well, optimized it, moved on to YouTube, did really well, optimized it. Now I'm on podcasting. Now I'm on the stage. So, so what then? I suppose are you planning on doing? What are the, what are we going to see of Pat Flynn? I mean, what are the, the next few trends that you've spotted that you go right? I'm going to be speaking more. What are some other things over the next year or two? Yeah, well, I'm, I am definitely going to be speaking more just because it's been a passion of mine, and I want to become known as a as like one of the best speakers um, yeah. I just that's what I'm striving for I when I go into something like when I go into something I want I want to be great at it yeah. right um, you know you should always go all in on it uh, so, so a lot of speaking I know there's a book in me as well I know there's yeah. mul multiple books in me and I, you know our friend Chris Ducker and yeah, you just, know a, a lot of other friends that I have are publishing their books and I'm getting like really jealous of them I see it in the bookstore I'm like oh, I want to be right there next to you yeah. um, so that'll happen and that's more of a personal goal too because I know there's some debate about traditional yeah. versus self and all that stuff but you know it's been a life dream of mine to take my kids to the bookstore and yeah. find my book and show them daddy's book you know that's and my kid uh, my kids are almost two and and almost five so that's almost the perfect age have you got for a that. core idea for the book yet? Obviously, you're all about passive income. Is that like, is there something? That oh, there's. I mean, there's ten books in my head, and, yeah. I, and I'm sort of weighing the options and doing surveys to see which one is the best one to start with. Um, That's another insight. You've said it a few times. Going back to the audience and asking, well, what do you want? What is it that you want to see? What's working? I think that's. Yeah, that's something I've been really big on now. Going to my audience. And, you know, it's hard to survey them. I mean, surveys are great. You can get good information from surveys. But what I love to do is find the people who I know are raving fans. Mm -hmm. Go to them, make them feel special, and ask them, what, what, where would you like to see me go? And they will tell you the, the best information in the world. Because they're, they're probably already your customers. Yeah. That's your target audience. So why don't you ta tap into that yeah, yeah. and their love for your brand into taking your brand to the next level. Yeah. You know, too many people try to build stuff from scratch and, you know, start with what's already there. As a raving fan, video. I want to see more video. <laughs> okay, so. you can hold me accountable there for that. There you go, done. Sounds good. We might wrap up there. Thank you so much for your time. It's very generous you, with your Appreciate ideas it. and your thoughts. If people want to find out more about you, where do they head? Smartpassiveincome.com would be the place to go. And uh, if you watched this and you loved it, or even if you didn't, at Pat Flynn on Twitter. And uh, I'd love to say hi to you. Thank you and best of luck. Cool. Thanks, guys.